and introduced the latest 1804 Huygens co-localization analyzer. During this webinar, you are welcome to submit questions, and I will answer some of them at the end of the webinar. If your questions is not answered today due to our limited time, we will answer your questions via email. So all questions are welcome and all questions will be answered as well. Um, first of all, the overview of today's webinar, I will briefly talk about the motivation of doing co-localization analysis. And also before we do co-localization analysis, we do need to pay attention with our images, some in image restoration both before co-localization analysis of course, I will in introduce the co-localization coefficients and demo the latest Huygens co-localization analyzer. Okay, the first topic, well, why do we need co-localization and what does the result tell us? Co-localization analysis can provide information of two objects if they are related. For example, a protein related to another molecule or is a com component A close to component B? If they are, well, are they coexist or are they overlap? If they are coexist and or overlap, could A and B are related? Um, look at this well, cartoon as an example. I assume well that we need to see if the orange or well, star-shaped well, molecules, if they are optic by cell. To do that, well, I, I assume the little star-shaped well, molecule may interact with green receptor on the cell membrane. If so, maybe I could draw a conclusion that the star molecule is optic by cell via, well, for instance, well, receptor-mediated endocytosis. So I need to have some evidence to answer my research question here. For instance, if I could show 70% of the orange molecule, if they are very close to the green receptor, or if they are overlap in my image, then I may have some, I may have an answer already. So, Co-localization is about characterizing the degree of overlap or dependency between two ch channels of an image. Well, I have this quote here is from my colleagues. Well, he found this on the internet forum a while ago. I'd like to use it. Green and red make yellow. If you can clearly see difference in yellow signal between your treatment and control, the confocal image without quantification are generally accepted for publication, even in a journal. Well, this definition is really the simplest way to describe co-localization. If I have two channels, one red and the other one is green, when they overlap, I will see the overlap area in yellow. The yellow part is the part that I'm interested in. Of course, we all wish for experiment and analysis are so straightforward, but we do have some more questions and ob obstacles to overcome. First of all, well, this statement is very subjective and we, can, we cannot quantify our result. Also, what about 3D images, cell cultures, well, or cells from cell cultures, they are flat, but they are not two-dimensional. They are three-dimensional. What if I have the third channel that influences my observation? This is the reason we need to have a scientific analysis approach to quantify results and answer our questions. I'll come back to the co-localization and the coefficients later. And now I would like to talk about the restoration before image analysis. And why do we need to do that? Well, the first one is really important. And it's about the Ponster function, PSF. If you want to study a large image, I mean the object which is large, much large, much bigger than the microscope PSF, we can easily describe the co-localization result in overlap volume in percentage or distance between them. However, the more difficult part is when the objects, they are small, they are sub-resolution, such as a protein. In this case, the burning from the microscope PSF and the size of the PSF is very significant here. For example, if I perform um, co-localization analysis on a confocal image and compare the exact well, same image, but the image is actually, well, um, I, collected, I captured it with a stat system, a super-resolution system. The confocal image will show much higher co-localization coefficients than the stat image, but both results are correct. They are influenced by the Ponster function of the microscope system. That also means well, the co-localization coefficients if is affected by the resolution of the microscope system as well. Of course, when the resolution is uh, extremely high and it get higher and higher and higher, at some point we're not looking at overlap anymore. We should use the distance between molecules to determine 
if molecules are related to each other of, or if they are interact with each other. Well, since the burring from the microscope system PSF influenced the co-localization co -localization result, the solution is deconvolution. I would like to use a publication in 2004 as an example to explain it further. Well, this figure here, well, um, it's pretty much all straight out from the publication. On the left-hand side, you can see a column with simulated image with X, Y wheel. And on the right-hand side, it's the same image, but with X, Z wheel. And let, let's look at, well, the left-hand side, the X, Y wheel. And the column on the left, they are, well, after the convolution, their images after the convolution. And on the right, they're before the convolution. Well, if two channels are completely overlap, like the first well, um, column, um, if two channels are com completely overlap, the co-localization is 100% overlap. But if we move the red and green channels away from each other in the opposite di directions, and look at the co-localization results, when we increase the distance between two channels from 100 nanometer, 200 nanometers, 300 nanometers, 400 nanometers and 500 nanometers. We can clearly see the influence of the PSF on our co-localization measurements. If two, two channels are moving towards the opposite direction for 100 nanometer, before the convolution, the measurement is 74%. And after the convolution, the uh, co-localization measurement is 70%. If two channels are 400 nanometers away, if you look here, before the convolution, the measurement is still 34%, but after the convolution, we can only see more well, 8% co-localization. If two channels, they are 500 nanometers away from each other, before the convolution, the measurement is 27, 23%, and after the convolution is 2%. For the exact wheel, the same thing happened. If they're completely overlap, we have 100% overlap, we have no problem at, at all. But the co-localization is affected by the PSF if we move the channel away from each other in XZ. If two channels are 500 nanometers away from each other, before the convolution, we can see well we have 56% overlap, but after the convolution, it's only 5%. This demonstrates the PSF influence the co-localization results. Therefore, my first suggestion for the image is the convolution. I have another example here to show the convolution or restoration of the microscope PSF bearing could play a very positive role in co-localization results. This example here well, shows well, um, a hollow green sphere with a red particle. In the raw image well, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see well, uh, well, the red particle well, could be partially well, attached to the green sphere. But after the convolution, you can see they are they're clearly separated. Since the PSF can influence the co-localization results, the resolution of the image is equally important. When you do co-localization, you should be very careful to consider the X, Y, Z um, samplings. This example here will actually demonstrate well, the degree of undersampling. On the left-hand side, we have well correct sampled image and 1.54 times for undersample, three times undersample, six times undersample. If your image is severely undersampled, you can really see almost everything is uh, overlap. Almost everything is well, uh, you have 100% co-localization. So the, my tip here is always use a Nyquist calculator on our web page to calculate the most optimal sampling before we do our imaging. Now I'm going to uh, discuss some other issues that could influence with co-localization results. Bearing from the uh, PSF, noise, intensity variation, the background signals are always present in, well, I would say, almost all images. These factors will influence your co-localization result. So the first step is to use Huygens deconvolution to restore your image. Also be aware that well, your samples are always three-dimensional, just like your microscope PSF. That makes sense, right? So I will not use a 2D image for co-localization. I will try to use a three-dimensional image, a 3D image for co-localization analysis. 
And some other well, additional difficulties in colocalization analysis are color drift or well, chromatic operation, which can be restored by the Huygens co chromatic operation corrector. Cost talk, well, uh, if you do have cost talk, you can restore the Huygens cost talk well, uh, with the cost talk corrector. And also the area of background can also influence some of the coefficients. And I will get back to this well, um, later. Well, first of all, well, chromatic aberration. This slide, what well, we see here, is an example of clear chromatic aberration. The sample here is 100 nanometers multiple color beads. Both both image, well, they are well deconvolved already. On the left hand side, well, there, there is a you can really cl clearly see what well, there's a, a chromatic aberration, and on the right hand side, the color is correct. Um, aberration is corrected. And you can see what well, the chromatic operation actually reflected on our colocalization coefficients. This is the problem here. So this is the reason why we need to we, we need to always correct for chromatic operation before we perform colocalization analysis. And now cost talk. Cost talk happens when signal detected well um, in the wrong channel. Well, if the signal detected in another channel because of the emission spectra of two fluorophores are overlap. We could try to avoid this by knowing our dye. We can get this raw type of information from the specification from the fluorophore spectra. If we ca cannot avoid cost talk, if we have to use this dye, we can use well Huygens cost talk corrector and we will restore the image for you. And of course, well, we have more difficulties where or issues well in colocalization. We should always pay attention in sample preparation. Consider the well, um, well, the following well uh, potential issues. First of all, unspecific binding, or well, if we do have unspecific binding, how are we going to minimize it? The condition of the staining procedure, is it optimized or not? Uh, if the label structure can uh, interact if other unlabeled structure. If we do have it, we need to pay attention. Or, or autofluorescence. In a really short summary, well, um, before the colocalization, we need to, well, first of all, know the staining procedure and the dye we use to avoid cost talk or non-specific binding. When we capture the image, consult the Nyquist calculator and get the sampling right to get the optimal settings. And after imaging, well, we should restore the image while using deconvolution to correct the PSF bearing. Chromatic operation, well, if you do have chromatic operation, well, use the chromatic operation corrector. If you do have cost talk and you can't avoid this, well, Huygens, Huygens can give you a very good solution to use the cost talk corrector. Uh, hot and cold pixels. If your CCD or CMOS produce hot or cold pixels, well, uh, Huygens can also well um, remove this. Remove this for you as well. Well, this example here well is show a beads image before restoration. On the left hand side, this is before deconvolution, before chromatic operation correction, before uh, removal of uh, hot pixel. And on the right hand side, well, this is after well correction. We use well, Huygens deconvolution and uh, cross, um, the uh, chromatic operation corrector, and also remove for um, hot pixels. So this image is ready for colocalization, colocalization and analysis. And now, now I would like to discuss some more well, um, about colocalization coefficients, or in a, another word, how do we interpret colocalization? Well, I'm not going to go into a lot of mathematics, well, but instead I would like to use some examples to explain this. In the upper sample example, which uh, it shows four uh, green objects of which two of them are perfectly overlapping with two red objects. So 100% red objects overlap with some green objects, but only 50% of the green objects over of overlap with red objects. The other example, the lower example, shows there's no green dots overlapping with red dots, but all green dots, they are really close to the red dots. Well, this, but they have no, uh, they have 0% of colocalization. This also will get us well thinking. Huh? And with this example, the left hand side example shows that we have four green square and they overlap with one fourth 
every each one of them they overlap with one fourth one fourth of the uh, red square. On the right hand side, we can see only one green square overlap with one red square. But if we calculate well the colocalization coefficients, the result is that they are the same. If we will only look at really just only look at the volume overlap in the entire image, both this well, both of the uh, colocalization coefficients, they are exactly the same. Well, all these results well uh, shows well that there's no simple way to define colocalization. It does depend a lot on what defined what definition makes sense for your research questions and also the structure that you are labeling. For example, if you know my well, if I know why my neighbor well would be within within the nucleus, and I would not well, look at for look counting the signals outside the nucleus or even outside the cell membrane, that makes sense, um, right? And a very popular popular approach for colocalization analysis is to calculate a single number that's based on the pixel value from the entire image or an area of interest of the image. We use this number or we call it coefficients to represent our result. Of course, ideally, we would like to have such a coefficient that can answer our research question, and it should also be quantitative and reproducible. Well, this slide here will show a lot of a list of commonly used colocalization coefficients. You can calculate them from the Huygens software. They are the Pearson coefficients, object Pearson coefficients, Spe Spearman coefficients, object Spearman co coefficients, overlap. Mendel's coefficients, binary intersections co coefficients, least ICQ, uh, Van Steen, so CCF. All this well, um, background, all the ma mathematics background, you can find it from our webpage. And each of the coefficients, they have their own mathematical co uh, definition. They also have their advantage and disadvantage. For instance, for well, Pearson coefficients, well, we use it to, uh, we use the whole, um, calculate the whole image, but object Pearson, we only take the object into account. And well, for each work coefficients, I'm not going to in, go into a lot of details because of time limit, but I'll use some example to explain them. Well, first of all, the Pearson coefficients. The Pearson coefficients is one of the most common and used coefficients in co-localization. To interpret the value, one is 100% overlap or 100% co correlated. And zero means two channels uh, randomly exist in the in the image. They are no they have no correlation. Negative value means well they are anti correlation. The limitation of Pearson coefficients is that well the coefficients is limited to a linear de dependency. In addition, but well, this is sensitive to the average intensity in both channels. When they are larger, when you have larger or well, bigger uh, background regions. It can cause our artifacts lowering lowering the Pearson coefficients results. Well, I'm not going. I'm going to use an example to compare the overlap and Pearson coefficients. Maybe this is easier for uh, for everyone to understand. The slides I show here were some example in different interpretations of colocalization when we are using either um, overlap or Pearson. The first one show. Well, none of the red dots overlap with the green dots. The overlap coefficient is zero, which is well pretty well um, intuitive, pretty straightforward. But it it means well no pixel in two channels overlap. But well, if we look at well the Pearson um, coefficients, the result is negative. It's a little bit more difficult to explain. It's it's a bit less well intuitive. The zero background is taken into account when calculating the Pearson coefficients. Because of this, well, the Pearson, co co uh, the Pearson coefficients is actually not minus one. It's a, a little bit higher. The value is minus uh, 0.22. It's therefore more challenging to, um, to interpret in, in this case. The following example, you can see, well, um, uh, there are partial overlap between some of the objects in both channels. Overlap coefficients is again easier to interpret. You can see roughly a quarter of the um, area of two channels they overlap. The Pearson shows a result that close to zero, which is again caused by the relatively large zero background. When the overlaps start to well 
increase, like the third um, example. The, e the effect of the zero border background on uh, peace and coefficients start to become less. So we can also see the uh, coefficients actually increase. And the last example is a, is a well, I would say it's an uh, extreme case. No red is overlapping with the green, but all space where green is zero is filled with red. So red becomes the background. This leads to a perfect negative um, correlate, correlation for the Pearson. So this is the reason when we see the Pearson uh, coefficient is minus one and when overlap is zero. Well, both of the value, well, they are correct, but they are just using different definition. When we're using the Mendel's coefficients, the overlap coefficient can split into two parts as initially proposed by uh, Dr. Eric Mendes. The advantage is that both coefficients are quite intuitive to understand that you can investigate the amount of signal overlap of green and red or red and green. The main disadvantage of Mendes coefficients is, over, is um, Mendes coefficient always requires a well-defined threshold in order to make sense. For most other coefficients, well, a threshold is actually an, um, an optional. The following cartoons will illustrate that Mendel is coefficients, they are quite easy to understand. On the left hand side, we can well we have particles in red channel. Some of them are located in the cell nucleus, well, let's say well the bright area. And some of them they are in the darker well green area. They let's say what well, let's let's assume this is the rest of the cells. And the Mendel's coefficient is 0.67 with a threshold of 50% of green, green signal. That implies 67% of the red signal, the, right, the red particle, lie within the nucleus. When all particles have the same brightness, that also me means well, 67% um, of the red particle are within the nucleus. The right hand side shows the same green, well, let's say a green cell, but instead of having well-defined particles in the red channel, we only see a blurry region in red. The Mendel's coefficient of 0.63 implies that 63% of the signal lies within the nucleus. So we do, when we're doing colocalization studies with coefficients, we do have some drawbacks because while well, we actually summarize all the information from two channels, or well, let, in another words, well, millions of voxels from your image to just a single number, just a single coefficient. So you do lose quite some information and also, some coefficients only make sense in the frame of reference. It's a Pearson, it's a Pearson of uh, O3. It's a, it is a clearly positive correlation. Or if a result of a minus point, uh, point 0.2, 0 0.2, it's a negative, well, it's an absolute negative correlation. And some of the coefficients, they are sensitive to the background and also the threshold value. So well, uh, some advice here was uh, always use a control group as a reference. And of course, well, if we have some stat stat uh, statistics to prove it, and it will also help as well. And with the colocalization map, well, let's get back to one of the example I just, well, I just showed previously. The example shows well, some problems with when we, well, um, reduce your inf information to just one single number or one coefficient. Because I just mentioned, um, two colocalization coefficients of two different images, well, they will be exactly the same because we are calculating the, um, the volume of um, um, overlap. And the, in many cases, well, it is useful to use well, a, well, what we call is a colocalization map to help us to guide us to visualize well the location of colocalization so we use the overlap area and then we use this to generate a map to show where are our colocalization location and now i'm going to go to the uh the huygens well, colocalization analyzer um the colocalization analyzer i'm going to well have a quick demo as well uh well after well, the slides here i'm going to well, first, I'm going to point out a few useful features with the slides, and then I will jump to the Huygens Professional and then do a quick demo. This is Huygens' well, uh, 1804 colocalization interface. At the bottom, you can select well, um, you can select well, really um, different tools to help you. Huygens' colocalization is in fact very advanced 
It analyzes well 3D images. You have the freedom to select channels. You can draw an area which is of your interest only. If you have a time lapse image, you can analyze all time points if you, write, if, if you would like to do so. First of all, I would like to introduce the background, background estimator. Huygens, Huygens colocalization has three different automatic threshold estimator built in. Well, the first one is the Gaussian minimum, which is the fastest and the simplest. And the second one is the Causes methods, which is the published me methods. And the third one, which is uh, optimized methods, which is based on the Causes methods. The region of interest or a um, mask image. In the third tab here, underneath here, you'll be able to select what mask or what region of interest. The image show the regions of interest here. This is really useful when you just want to apply the analysis on the cell, on one cell or one region at a time. The colocalization maps. Well, as introduced earlier, a colocalization map is very useful to visualize uh, the region that you are interested. You can vis visualize the colocalization map in colocalization analyzer using the built-in ISO service renderer. Also, it is possible to export the colocalization map, save it on your hard drive or uh, append the map as a new channel to your original set of Huygens, data set in Huygens. Well, this example here show that well the colocalization map, well, uh, in this case was well, is generated by the Pearson map. As an example, you can visualize and guide you where are the locations you can see colocalization, and you can compare to the to your raw raw image with a two D uh, two channel image. Well, with the uh, this is with the maximum intensity projection, you can compare to the raw image. Well, which part of the um, of the signals are uh, overlap. So that you, own, you, you are not only having a coefficient, you also have a map to help you as well. And when you're comparing to an image, you can identify well, some green particles, well, in this case, well, that do not well, show up in the colocalization map. For instance, well, the background or uh, this area. And of course, Huygens can measure all colocalized um, objects and also export the data to an Excel sheet. And the final example shows well the colocalization result before and after Huygens deconvolution. You can see on the right hand, on the left hand side, well, uh, the burning of the PSF, the noise will affect colocalization results. And now I'm going to quickly um, end this, and I'm going to quickly well uh, demonstrate. Uh, 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 demonstrate how well, uh, Huygens colocalization work. What you see here is a Huygens well, professional and 1804, which is the latest version. And you can see in the image here, well, which is a three-dimensional image, well, I just mentioned, um, and also it's already deconvolved and also corrected. So I can go to analysis, colocalization analyzer. And now you can see, well, this, well, uh, this map I just show you, this uh, windows I just show you, and underneath every tab you can you can really just select them. And the first one is frame channel. If you have a time lapse image, well you can select it here, so you don't need to do uh, the time lapse image uh, frame by frame or time point by time point. And you can also select the uh, channel. For instance, I'm interested in channel one and channel two, so you can clearly see it. Well, it's already already showing. Well, um. On the main window here already. Thresholds, I just uh, mentioned, we have three different uh, threshold estimation, and if you just select more one of them, Huygens will correct, uh, will calculate the threshold for you. We'll, well, uh, and then if we, if we go to area of interest, you can well, select more this icon, and we can actually well, draw an area. For instance, I'm only interested in this area that I draw, and then make it as my region of interest. I'll make it a little bit less, um, less bright. And now we can see all the coefficients I just mentioned. 
And also while here, well, there's a big eye here. If you click this big eye, it will go straight to our web page and give you some background of all the coefficients. And, and over here, you can see what this co-localization map is generated uh, by, from the Pearson uh, co uh, coefficients. And of course, if you want to select more other coefficients to generate your co-localization map, you are also welcome to do so. Then I press compute, and Huygens will do the um, computing for you. And you can clearly see well all these well, objects here. Well, they're within my area of interest. Of course, if you if you would like to uh, to analyze the whole image more, well, of course, this is also fine. You just don't need to select the area of interest. And surface and um, the uh, maximum intensity renderer, you can uh, you can play around with a bit of uh, the change of color or visualize for well, your result. And the last but not least, well, you can see this object well, uh, statistics. And if you click, well, analyze all, and it will give you all the objects, well, which I just um, uh, just measure here. And of course, all the objects are within my area of interest. If you don't have this area here, this uh, ROI here, well, of course, well, what it can give you is the whole image. And well, last but not least, well, all image, all, all the results can be saved with this well, colocalization map. Well, for instance, well, um, this map I would like to export it to the uh, to the main. Of course, you can do it. You can uh, you can do this, and you can see with the uh, with the thumbnail overview, you can see there's a the um, the colocalization map. Well, which I just export. And now I'm going to come back to my um, to my um, presentation. I'm going to give a well, give you some technical message. Well, this is well, just a suggested workflow for the whole co-localization well, experiment and analysis. First of all, what is your research questions? We need to define our questions. So I think this is really applied to all experiment. What co-localization approach is best to answer my questions? Correlation, co-occurrence, overlap, or distance? You can see, well, you can also use the object analyzer to do that. And well, with the object analyzer, of course, well, what you will uh, calculating will be the object-based well, analysis uh, co-localization. And choose your flow pros or emission filters to avoid cost talk. If you really can't avoid it, well, um, OK, this is also fine. Um, well, um, minimize the possible non-specific binding optimize well, your staining procedure. This is very important because well, I think this is also applied to all experiments as well. When you're doing imaging, well, acquire your image with the correct uh, Nyquist sampling. This is well, important, well, I just well, mentioned about the resolution of, the, of, of your image, is, it is important. And avoid detection, detection uh, saturation or, or clipping or saturate or overexpose well, your sample. Always get a 3D image for co-localization because, well, even, well, uh, you can say, well, oh, the cells are there flat, but they are not two-dimensional, they are three-dimensional. You'll get a lot more information if you have 3D image. And after you have the image, well, use the, uh, use the Huygens deconvolution um, uh, to correct, uh, to restore your image. If you have chromatic operation, you can also use the chromatic operation corrector. Cost talk, if you can't avoid it here, then you can use the cost truck corrector uh, to correct your image. Hot and cold pixels, well, uh, resto uh, restorations is also well if you uh, for your uh, CMOS or CCD. And then, well, we can use the colocalization analyzer. Um, well, I think this is uh, all I'm going to talk about colocalization. And our next webinar will be talking about the advanced object analyzer, which will also well mention about colocalization as well but it will be an object space more colocalization. And now it's time to um, for some questions. I think I, I see some questions here already. This is the first question is from Kevin. Um, you mentioned some co coefficients are sensitive to the background area. If there is a way to minimize the inference from the background. Well, this is a really good question. Uh, thank you. Um, I mentioned the Pearson or and the object Pearson coefficients. The difference well, between them are well with Pearson, you can calculate the whole image with the background signal. So it does well affect well, um, the background does affect well, your coefficients. But if, if you really want, you can use object Pearson. It can on, it only take the signal from the objects. This is why the name is object 
Pearson. So you can minimize well the background inference by using the, um, the object Pearson. And I have the second question as well. Uh, could you share the work, workflow slide, the last one? I found this useful. Oh, thank you very much. Well, no problem at all. Well, I'll send this out to all audience. Well, if you would like to have the, uh, the last well, workflow uh, summary slides. Okay, well, I'm going to answer the last questions here. Um, when do we use the object-based co-localization? Um, the object-based co-localization can give you a lot more details. If you are interested in the co-localization of two overlap objects, for instance, for well, their volume overlap or intensity overlap, you can use that. Or if you're interested in the distance between two objects, the object-based co-localization will you, give you all measurements between objects. So you can well, uh, give, a, for instance, where well, you can make a def definition for yourself. If two objects, if they are within certain distance, they will be related. Well, actually, well, on the 3rd of July, my colleagues, well, uh, Remco, he will go through this, well, uh, this option. And well, uh, thank you all for your time. And the rest of the questions will be answered via email. And stay tuned to our webpage and also for more webinars and other information. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.